Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And as you can see on your screen or after clicking this thumbnail, well, we're going to be talking about Microsoft Times Activision divided by Sony. Yes, Sony and Microsoft have escalated their war of words today with Microsoft talking specifically about the deal in a phraseology that I find to be, as you can tell from the thumbnail, a little bit disingenuous. Since we have dragged Sony on some of the things they have said in respect of this pending near $70 billion acquisition, it seems only fair that we talk a little bit about Xbox and when they go a little overbroad in their arguments with regulators and against Sony. If you're interested in this story and you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, please do check out our playlist, Microsoft Times Activision. This will be the 34th video in that playlist and the last of which talked about Sony really going after Microsoft here. One of the positions that I have taken since this started was that this deal is very likely to go through, that the antitrust standards, the precedents in various jurisdictions around the world would suggest that Microsoft has the right to make even an acquisition of this size because it doesn't represent a hugely significant portion of the market in video gaming on the whole. But we're going to talk about that as well. And Sony, having seen some success with reports that we've seen out of the UK, with answers that we've seen in places uh, in South America to responses to their regulatory authorities, have seemingly gone all in in either trying to stop this deal or making very, very sure that Call of Duty in particular is put in a consent decree or an undertaking document or a settlement agreement or whatever your jurisdiction of choice calls these things in order to make sure that PlayStation continues to have access to what is a moneymaker for their platform. Going so far as in this games industry biz quote in saying that the deal itself, Microsoft's purchase of Activision, will have major negative implications for gamers and the future of the gaming industry which I brightly called out in that earlier video as being very self-absorbed about whether or not Sony, PlayStation, and their existing market share represents all of the gaming industry or the future for gamers. Spoiler alert, it does not. But Microsoft has had its own issues with putting communications out. And I think if we're going to discuss Sony in that way, it's only fair that we discuss Xbox in that way. In immediate response to that PlayStation statement, actually Phil Spencer went out with an interview with, I believe this is CNBC International, that I actually thought was quite effective, that said basically we're out there to put value in people's pockets and that's the right way competition is to work. We've got Game Pass, a subscription service, a cloud model, and that innovation is what we want to bring to the party. But that wasn't what Microsoft finished with, and that's not what we're talking about today when I talk about disingenuousness. Now, instead, we're going to be talking about a Bloomberg TV interview that was actually conducted not just by Phil Spencer, but also the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, who, in order to understand these various positions, is Phil's boss and the head of one of the largest companies on earth, who, as Bloomberg TV puts in their tweet, said he's confident regulators will approve of the deal to buy Activision for about $69 billion. And speaking with Emily Chang TV, he says Sony, the number one player in the gaming industry, has already made several recent acquisitions. Now, I responded to this. I've talked about this in other forums, and that is a wildly disingenuous way to frame what is happening in the video game industry, and we have to talk about it. This is then doubled up again in Bloomberg itself, the newspaper saying, if this is about competition, let us have competition, which is of course the slide that I started out with because the notion that Sony's purchases of these various companies represent competition and that Microsoft is doing exactly the same thing is at best ill-considered. And let's talk about why. First, we look at the Bloomberg article itself, which is paywalled, but to be frank, doesn't add a lot of extra analysis to the quotes that Sachin Nadella gave. So let's go to the primary source material instead. We're going to divide this into four separate sections, one of which is that competition phrase. So only three of substance. And we're going to talk about what Sachin Nadella has said and why it isn't the strongest argument for Microsoft, even though I don't have any issue with them posing it. They are just advocating for their own position. That doesn't mean we have to take it seriously. So Mr. Nadella begins for us in gaming, And this is an important part of the phraseology. Microsoft is a huge multi-trillion dollar market capitalized company, but that huge consortium of technologies and huge market share in the world on the whole doesn't necessarily inform regulators as to evaluating this deal. In any regulatory environment that's looking at 
mergers and acquisitions, you have to figure out what the appropriate market you're talking about is. Now, the UK brought in some notions that the Microsoft is just big in technology in general, some of which are warranted, the things that are adjacent to gaming, cloud gaming, maybe subscription services as a completely different market to uh, buy and play gaming. Maybe there are weaknesses in those particular concepts, but they're at least related to gaming. But also the concept that Microsoft is big. It has a lot of cash. It does other things. It has Windows in various computers. It is the most popular operating system in various jurisdictions on earth. And that probably isn't appropriate. And so Microsoft, with Satya Nadella's quote here in interviews in general, tries to frame it as we're talking about gaming, not technology, whatever that might mean. Obviously, we swamp the size of Sony in both cash and technology position, but not in gaming. For us, in gaming... We have one goal, which is to bring more games to more gamers on all platforms and provide more choice for publishers everywhere and developers everywhere. Now, this has been their watchword in terms of describing this particular acquisition for a long time, saying, look, we're trying to put subscription services in the hands of people. People like that product. They like it better, says Microsoft, than actually buying the game on the whole. We are providing more avenues, more innovative ways to compete in the video game industry than just the walled garden model that Sony and Nintendo approve of. And so we are adding choice specifically to consumers, but they know that the regulators are at least a bit concerned about the publishers and the developers. So that's who Satya Nadella chooses to highlight here and to less effect. Consumers get more choices from having more business models and more competitors in the space. That is clear. Do publishers have more choices if one company starts to take a very strong network effect strength in position in cloud gaming or subscription gaming or console gaming on the whole or God forbid, gaming on the whole? And if those sounded similar to you, that's one of the issues that is facing regulators and that Microsoft is trying to confuse the issue on. What is the proper market? Is it gaming on the whole? Because then Microsoft has a pretty good argument to say that they aren't that big of a player. Is it only console gaming? Or is it the UK's approach? Could it be subscription service gaming where Microsoft has a dominant position? Or could it be cloud infrastructure as applied to gaming where Microsoft basically has no argument against it because of all the advantages that they have in that marketplace along with this particular acquisition? Now, on that topic of an acquisition, the other question you have to ask yourself when this is the response is, okay, cloud provides choice, subscription provides choice, Game Pass, I like it, a lot of people like it. How does the purchase of Activision relate to providing more choice for gamers, more choice for publishers, and more choice for developers? That is a difficult rhetorical case to make. So you say these sentences and they sound nice. They sound like white knighting. We've heard Microsoft do this now for eight solid months. But when you really break things down, you close your eyes and you think, okay, but how does purchasing one of the biggest publishers on earth relate to this concept? Well, yes, they're going into Game Pass, but what was preventing them from going into Game Pass before? Yes, you're making them available through xCloud or on Windows, but that was, wasn't was otherwise preventable before either. How is this improving things? And so you've got this kind of sleight of hand that Satya Nadella and Microsoft have been using from the get-go. Now, that's not the most disingenuous. That's just advocating for your position, but it is very difficult to see how the purchase of Activision actually accomplishes this particular end. And so... Everything we are doing with our content, so this is, we're purchasing Activision with our cloud and community. We're talking to the UK. We're talking to the other regulators that we are talking to behind the scenes that we don't get perfect transparency on really is about driving that choice and that opportunity. This is a fine supposition. This is a fine motto or mission statement, but at no point do you actually tie those wires together. How does this purchase accomplish those things? Why shouldn't we be at least a bit concerned when a company buys an $8 billion company in ZeniMax and then buys a $70 billion company in Activision and in two fell swoops takes over a huge chunk of the market share and the market, which is otherwise, if we're being very mean about it, not earned by Microsoft. Right? Anybody with $78 billion can go and make these acquisitions and find themselves with that market share by virtue of their cash. And I think overall that can be a good thing. We like to have competition and we like to have people investing in an industry that we love. But as a company, as an infrastructure, you didn't build that uh, to put a phrase on it. And so people can be concerned about that and it doesn't lead to where Satya Nadella wants it to lead to. 
Similarly, with his second statement here, he's talking about the regulators and the deal overall. He wants people to know that he is very, very confident. Now, of course, any acquisition of this size will go through scrutiny. We've said that a lot in this space, but we feel very, very confident that will come out, that the deal will go through. Now, I have long said here, and I continue to say here in this space, I think it's about a 70, 30% chance of getting through, that, that seven times out of 10, this deal is going to get through in substantially the way that it was described in January of this year. Now, I've also said, I think a consent decree is going to be required by the FTC and is going to be required in the various other jurisdictions, whatever they wind up calling it in the UK, they are undertakings. And that consent decree or undertakings document is very likely to say something along the lines of Call of Duty has to stay on Sony for a while. Is that fair? If you're an Xbox fan, I can't tell you that it is. Is it fair if you're a Sony fan and they're whining about Call of Duty? I still can't tell you that it is, but that seems to be the real politic of what we are looking at right now. And it is why Microsoft offered that to the world at large without any other commentary very shortly after announcing the deal earlier this year. They have signaled that they are willing to do that kind of consent decree. Now, are the regulators going to ask for more? Remember, their authority only comes from the notion that they could bring a claim that this acquisition otherwise violates whatever antitrust laws they're looking at. Here, it's the Clayton Act uh, and the Sherman Act, but Clayton discusses mergers and acquisitions specifically. So here they have to say that the acquisition without a consent decree causes them problems. And if Microsoft decided that they wanted to fight that, well, then they could take them to federal court. Which leads us to the most disingenuous argument that maybe any side has made in this deal so far. And it goes a little something like this. Satya Nadella talking again. You know, we are number four, number five, depending on how you count in gaming. In fact, the number one player in this case, Sony, I think even in this period, acquired three companies. Now, you've heard this kind of commentary online. This is the Reddit post that says something along the lines of this. This is not what I actually expect to come out of the CEO of one of the biggest technology companies on earth because it is so disingenuous. And if you're not familiar, disingenuousness is a lack of sincerity. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are trying to put a lie uh, on the court, uh, in my line of work, or on the public, just in general, in terms of corporate messaging. But it does mean that their argument here is not very believable. So let's break it down a little bit. First, we have this opening part. We're number four or number five, depending on how you count in gaming. Now, we don't get any other context for that, but we can kind of figure out what they're likely talking about. And that is overall gaming uh, and revenue. So we can go and we can look at nice articles that have been put up by places like Eurogamer this May, and we can see that a company by the name of New Zoo was trying to put this stuff together and came up with a list of top 10 public companies by game revenues. And we've got Tencent here at the top. We've got Sony, then we've got Apple, then we've got Microsoft, then we've got Google. And then things go down a little bit, but it's worthwhile to know that Activision Blizzard itself appears on this list, and that is what is proposed to be acquired by Microsoft in this deal. Now, a couple of things jump out at you, right? So one, Microsoft is fourth on this list if we take into account Tencent and Apple. And we'll talk about why that maybe isn't the right thing to do. But if we do take it as given here, then Sony isn't number one. In order to make Sony number one, you have to get rid of Tencent and probably you have to get rid of Apple, which in that case would make Microsoft number two. So the very first rhetorical kind of ploy you see here is the suggestion that they're number five, potentially. The number five pops out here and Sony is number one. When in general, you have to take this particular information in both directions simultaneously in order to arrive at Sony being number one while they are number four. And why do I say Tencent and Apple and Google are probably not what we are talking about? Well, it's because that's what Microsoft said. Going back into May and the Epic versus Apple case, which I have some familiarity with in this space, you might recall that Microsoft actually testified in this particular situation because as I had talked about on my channel, Epic's argument that Apple was the single brand purveyor of an iOS access point and was otherwise acting as a monopolist in controlling that access could destroy the console video game system ecosystem. And Lori Wright at Microsoft went in on Epic's behalf and said, no, no, they are different. 
Apple's attorneys issued a dire warning to Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft during its opening statement, says The Verge, saying that their business models were all fundamentally similar. If Epic prevails, other ecosystems will fall too. Worthwhile to note that this argument held some purchase with the judge, and she actually wrote about it when she put forth the decision in favor of Apple. But today, Epic called up Microsoft's Xbox business development head, Lori Wright, as a sympathetic witness. In response to a line of questioning, Wright divided computing devices into special purpose and general purpose devices in a way that clearly defined iPhones as the latter. The Xbox, as Wright describes it, is a special purpose device. You are basically building a piece of hardware to do a specific thing. The Xbox is designed to give you a gaming experience. People buy an Xbox because they want to play games. As a result, Microsoft keeps tight control of what content users can access. It's a curated, custom-built hardware software experience, and the market is much smaller. Tens or hundreds of millions sold compared to billions of Windows devices. So right from the top here, you have Microsoft actually stating that the marketplace that describes Tencent as number one and Apple as number three and Google as number five is not what we should be talking about when we are discussing the relevant market to an acquisition by Microsoft of, in particular, Activision. We're going to put King to the side for a moment because nobody's really discussing King or the mobile entrance of Microsoft into that portion of the video game market. Tencent makes most of its money off of mobile games. Apple makes all of its money off of mobile games, similarly to Google. So if we are talking about what Microsoft self-describes as a separate market, then what we're really looking at is Sony at number one, and Microsoft at number two. More disturbingly for Microsoft's argument is once they purchase Activision, is Microsoft at number one and Sony at number two, again, in that market of specialized devices being sold under TVs and whatnot. Now you might say, Microsoft's doing other stuff, Rick. They're putting stuff on Windows. They're putting stuff on cell phones. That's great. But what regulators are going to be looking at, what they are apparently most concerned by, if you read things like the UK report, is the actual markets that Microsoft has this primary position in. And if they go and buy Activision and that changes the market share such that Microsoft is in a position where they could monopolize the market, they could change prices, they could decrease quality, well then, regulators are right to be concerned. So this number four, number five, number one thing is basically outright disingenuous in the first instance. The second portion of this is why this quote exists in the first place, which is Satya Nadella going out there and saying, well, the first place company, I think even in this period, acquired three companies. So let's talk about that, shall we? If we look at the Wikipedia entry alone for just what Sony has purchased in 2022, remembering that the Activision deal was announced in January of 2022, you've got the purchase of a company called Last Angle from Anaplex. You've got the purchase of Haven Studios. You've got the purchase of Bungie. And you've got the purchase of Savage Game Studios. This is Sony Pictures right here. And Repeat GG is video game related, but it's a leaderboard technology service. If you want to count that, you are more than welcome to. Either way, outside of Bungie, we're talking about a company in Haven that is a new studio that has yet to put out a game. And similarly for Savage Game Studios, a new company that hasn't put out a game that is intended to reach the mobile division or the division of non-specialty devices that we've already talked about, Microsoft has said is not a part of this market analysis. By comparison, Microsoft announced the purchase of Activision Blizzard for near $70 billion, which may be bigger than the culmination of every other acquisition in the history of video games, and self-congratulatorily said this included 10,000 employees. So actually going out there and comparing Sony's acquisition of these companies to the purchase of Activision Blizzard is as disingenuous as it gets. You might say, okay, Rick, well, that's just revenue, right? It's 10,000 employees. It's a publisher, but Bungie's a publisher. Sure, they only make one game, but Sony has grand designs on them, and it's a multi-billion dollar acquisition. Does the size really matter that much? To which I would say, yes, it does. If we look at, for instance, the horizontal merger guidelines here, we will see that one of the things that the government looks at is what your market concentration is. Or as they put it, market concentration is a function of the number of firms in a market and their respective market shares. Now that you do some math on this to create the herfindahl hirschman index, we're not going to go too far into the details here, except to note that it gives proportionally greater weight to the market shares of the larger firms 
including the leading position firms, in accord with their relative importance in competitive interactions. The leader gets an advantage because they are the leader. In evaluating horizontal mergers, the agency will consider both the post-merger market concentration and the increase in concentration resulting from the merger. So again, using our helpful Eurogamer chart here, if Xbox vaults itself into number one off the backs of two deals in consecutive years, that's something that regulators can in fact take a note of and it's disingenuous to suggest that Sony moving around a billion here or a billion there with mostly acquisitions of tiny, tiny companies, is it all comparable? Now, you might also say, Rick, you're talking about horizontal mergers. Isn't this more of a vertical merger? Microsoft sells consoles. They sell other technology factors. And this isn't horizontal necessarily. Well, first, I'd argue that it's both. Microsoft is in the business of publishing video games and they're purchasing a publisher. So it is horizontal. But even the vertical merger guidelines say exactly the same thing. The general purposes and limitations of market definition described in section four of the horizontal merger guidelines are also relevant when the agencies define markets for vertical mergers and the agencies generally use the methodology set forth in those horizontal merger guidelines to define relevant markets for vertical mergers. So the nature of the merger here doesn't matter when we are evaluating the disingenuousness of the statement. Now, again, I want to take a step back here. We're almost done with this conversation. And that is one thing I want to point out. I don't have any issue with Microsoft actually going out here and saying this. I don't have any issue with Sony going out here and saying Call of Duty is the most specialist game ever and the PlayStation will die in a fire if we can't otherwise shoot people down corridors in modern and World War II settings. I don't have a problem with advocating for your corporate position, but that doesn't mean that we all on the outside have to take them as sincere or relatable or listen to their arguments and just take them on face. We don't have to do that, folks. We can look at what Sony said and say, <laughs> that's ridiculous. And we can look at Satya Nadella and Xbox and say, this, this is ridiculous. You're futzing with numbers. You're trying to make it best for you. And that makes it worse for you, in my opinion, when we're looking at the rhetoric and you're trying to compare Sony buying companies like Savage Games and Haven and Fire Sprite with the purchase of the owners of Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, and King Mobile Development. And we just don't have to buy it, folks. We don't. So when he finishes off by saying, so if this is about competition, let us have competition. We have to understand that this is self-motivated rhetoric and it is disingenuous to the largest degree possible. What we are talking about here probably should be allowed to go through. I've said it for 34 episodes now. I will continue to say it here. I don't believe Microsoft takes a position that allows them to monopolize the various markets that we're talking about, nor do I believe the definition of the markets should be separated out across subscription versus pay or even cloud services and infrastructure. I don't believe the UK will actually wind up coming down too hardly on that when they get to their phase two review. And yet we can still call out bad arguments when we see them. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoy talking about the law and business of video games, technology, software, pop culture, and more, please consider supporting the channel. We cannot do it without viewers and listeners like you. Best way to get us money is through our Utreon. That gets us the best rates and the most of your dollars to us. Patreon is also acceptable. If neither of those float your particular boat, just subscribing, telling your friends, sharing videos like this around, leaving up votes, or hey, Xbox fans, you want to leave those down votes, that's okay with me too. Otherwise, if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.